Hello and welcome to McLaren Port Huron today's health program. In today's program, I'm speaking with vascular surgeon, Dr. Catherine Foley, about some serious conditions that can affect our vascular system. So Dr. Foley, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. So let's start with peripheral vascular disease. Can you explain what that is? Peripheral vascular disease is a, a problem of the circulatory system, so blood vessels anywhere in the body that are, isn't in the heart that can have hardening of the arteries over time, plaque buildup, and atherosclerotic disease, among other things. So what causes peripheral vascular disease? So peripheral vascular disease is caused by hardening of the arteries due to plaque and cholesterol buildup. The arteries get a little bit injured when there's a lot of that toxin and cholesterol flowing through. Things like having high blood pressure, diabetes, being of the male sex, or smoking tobacco uh, tend to increase those, those risks. Genetics also play some role in the hardening of the arteries or atherosclerotic disease. So um, let's talk about some conditions that can affect the circulation towards our head and neck. Okay, so just like um, peripheral vascular disease anywhere in the body, hardening of the arteries can occur or there can be weakening of the artery causing aneurysmal disease. So either narrowing or, or weakening. With the arteries in the neck, the carotid arteries are what feed the brain. That along with the ones in the back, the vertebral arteries. What can happen is you get hardening of the arteries in the neck which can lead to symptoms of stroke. So like say we have a picture up, so this is an example for um, carotid arteries. Correct, yes. correct. So the common carotid artery is the one that comes at the base of the neck and it goes up and the internal carotid artery is the one that feeds the brain. So any narrowing there can be problematic if it gets to be too narrowed. So what kind of problems would people be at risk for? Typically you'll see issues with possible stroke. So things like facial droop, word finding problems, weakness on one side of the body. Um, they can go away or they can be something that continues for longer than 24 hours. Are there people that are more at risk for the carotid artery disease? Just like anywhere in the body, it's those same risk factors of atherosclerotic disease that happen in the heart. It's the same problems that you can have in the peripheral vascular system. So smoking is probably the number one risk factor that any person can have. And then high cholesterol. So really no family history or can that be? Family history can play a role. It's just not the main problem. Sometimes genetics uh, owe to a patient's high cholesterol and so then the cholesterol portion of it is the problematic portion. So how would you diagnose someone with, with carotid artery disease? Typically we do surveillance ultrasound. So if there's someone who has risk factors, we recommend undergoing an ultrasound. We look at the flow of the blood through the carotid artery or any of the narrowings. And just like you're a kid when you're playing with a hose and you start to cover your thumb on the hose and the water jets out faster, that's uh, kind of how we look at the, the blood flow on the ultrasound, is if it's flowing faster, then there's more of a narrowing. And so what kind of uh, ways do you treat that? There are a couple of different ways. Um, Typically we start off with medical management and using medications and then surveillance ultrasounds. And if you get to be too narrowed, then we start talking about ways to do a surgery or surgeries that we would need to do. Um, there's a couple of different ways. One would be an open surgery where we make an incision in the neck and cut down to the area of the plaque and the buildup. We open the artery and basically scoop out the plaque and put a patch on there and patch everything back up and sew everything back closed. The other two ways involve a stent. One is going across the femoral artery, up and around the aorta, up to the, the carotid artery. And then the other is a newer way that uh, my partner, Dr. Kapari, and I do. You make an incision at the base of the neck and deliver the stent through the, the carotid artery. And I think we have a little video for that. Okay, let's take a look. So at this portion here, looking at the carotid artery, this is a good old fashioned open procedure where we make a cut down to the level of the internal carotid artery, which is this one that feeds the brain. And we go down and get control of each side and then basically scoop out the plaque through the middle of there. Typically we'll put a patch on there to help maintain the size difference um, at that point. The other way would be a transfemoral stent where basically you have to come all the way up and across any different placking or levels before you put your protection device in. And as you can see, there's little pieces that are flicking up to the brain. This actually has the highest risk of stroke, is the transfemoral stent. It's still low, somewhere around 4%, but it is the highest. And then the T-car, so it's a transcarotid artery revascularization. The access is at the level of the common carotid artery, and there's a special way to do a flow reversal system. So basically we're able to 
decrease the flow going to the brain in order to protect it from any of those pieces that might be embolizing or flicking up to the brain and are able to put our stent in. So here I have an example of a patient that I did the transcarotid artery vascularization. As you can see here, this is the common carotid artery before it splits to the external carotid artery, which feeds the blood supply to the face, and then the internal, which goes up to the brain. And we're looking right here, that's a significant narrowing. And then in this picture, again, similarly, right here is the narrowing. After the procedure, we put a stent in the area, and as you can see, that area is much more open and then the plaque is plastered against the wall so it doesn't become problematic and causing little pieces to flick up to the brain. So a patient that would have this type of procedure, mm -hmm. um, how long are they in the hospital? What's their recovery like? Are there any restrictions? Yeah, typically for carotid surgery, any way we do them these days, it's um, an outpatient surgery but you stay overnight so it's not a formally true outpatient surgery. We need to keep a real close eye on blood pressure because the blood pressure control center of the body is partially here in the, in the neck at the spot where those um, arteries separate and one goes to the brain. So in order to keep good eyes on a patient we end up um, keeping them either in the ICU or in our special selective recovery area um, and typically they go home the next day. Yep, and are there any restrictions then after a procedure? Just uh, light duty kind of things for a couple of days, but the carotid artery procedures, patients tend to tolerate really well. And how do patients feel after the surgery? They don't really know much of a difference, to be quite honest with okay. you, and that's the other part about carotid surgery, is you don't know you have the problem until you look for it, unless you're having mini strokes or strokes. So that's why it's important to have the ultrasound to begin with. Dr. Foley, thank you so much for sharing this information with our audience. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for watching McLaren Port here on Today's Health. If you would like more information or to schedule an appointment, visit our website at www.mclaren.org forward slash phvascular. To watch additional videos, visit our website at www.mclaren.org forward slash phvideo. Thank you for watching McLaren Port here on Today's Health. I'm your host, Kelly DiNardo, and we'll see you next time.